Have you eaten recently? Eating is, of course, a necessity for us as humans. It provides us with the energy we need to carry about our daily activities, and it also provides us with the raw materials that we need to synthesize the various biomolecules inside our bodies. Now, what you may not realize is that eating actually uses a variety of oxidation and reduction reactions in order to convert that food into energy. Uh, so our food will contain molecules such as glucose, shown here. Uh, we'll react that glucose with oxygen in our body in an oxidation reaction, produce our oxidized carbon dioxide, as well as water, which are then the byproducts that we eliminate. This reaction produces a lot of energy. Um, so you might notice the similarities to the combustion reaction that we learned about um, earlier in organic chemistry. Um, and this energy is then what we use when we're doing things like moving the muscles of our body. Now, as we've previously discussed, oxidation reduction reactions are classified based on electron transfer between different molecules. Um, so when a, a, a molecule or atom is oxidized, it's losing its relative share of electrons. When a molecule is reduced, it gains electrons. Um, of course, we typically see this in uh, electrochemical reactions where we're actually able to transfer electrons directly between different compounds and even use those electrons uh, to do work in the form of electricity. Um, in organic chemistry and better chemistry, we more commonly see this based on changing the number of bonds to electronegative atoms. Uh, so when an atom is oxidized, it gains more bonds to uh, electronegative atoms. Um, so we assign an oxidation number of uh, plus one for every bond we have to a more electronegative atom as that more electronegative atom is going to be pulling away electrons and reducing our relative share of those electrons, right? So the relative charge, we would say, kind of increases because we're pulling away those negatively charged electrons. Um, in reduction, of course, we say that we are gaining bonds uh, to less electronegative atoms. Um, and of course, in this case, then, uh, we are gaining a larger share of electrons because those less electronegative atoms are more likely to uh, share their electrons with our particular atom. Right? So for every bond that we have to a, more, uh, to a less electronegative atom, um, that will give a minus one in our overall oxidation number as it's essentially going to be donating that extra negative charge over to us. Right? So again, if we go back to our sugar reaction here, that glucose um, being oxidized to create carbon dioxide. Um, so if we look at a particular carbon here, uh, so we have an oxygen attached, that would give us an oxidation number of plus one from that oxygen pulling away our electrons. And we have our hydrogen that's less electronegative, that gives us an oxidation number of minus one. Each of our carbon bonds here uh, contribute nothing, right, because they have equal electronegativity and, and equally share those electrons. And so our overall oxidation number for this given carbon here is zero. If we looked at our other carbons, you'd see they all have uh, similar oxidation numbers. And if we compare that to our carbon dioxide over here, so here we have four bonds to oxygens. So that's plus one, plus one, plus one, and plus one, four plus four total, right? What we see is that carbon is highly oxidized after our reaction. It's much more reduced at the beginning of our reaction, and that shows us that our carbon has indeed been oxidized during this process as we're creating that energy here. So what we're seeing here is, of course, an oxidation reaction occurring with our alcohol, right? We're starting with that alcohol in our sugar, where we have our carbon bonded to our oxygen and hydrogen. And of course, we have other carbons and or hydrogens attached here. And we're losing those hydrogens and adding more bonds to our oxygen here, 
and creating a variety of different uh, what we call carbonyl compounds where we have that carbon double bonded to oxygen. Right? In this case, we actually created a carbon dioxide molecule with two different double bonds to oxygen. Um, but if we just do a single oxidation reaction with an alcohol, we'll just produce a single carbonyl. Right? So this would be on the oxidation side, increasing the number of bonds to more electronegative atoms and decreasing the number of bonds to our less electronegative hydrogens. We can also take um, our carbonyl and go in the reverse direction. We can take a carbonyl and reduce it in order to create our alcohol. Right? So we add on new hydrogens as we eliminate that bond to our oxygen. We are then reducing that carbon as we're adding bonds to those less electronegative hydrogens. So both of these reactions will allow us to convert between different organic functional groups um, of that carbonyl and our alcohols. And so these are very useful reactions for us um, to quickly convert uh, these, these different molecules. Um, so the only thing we need here is some kind of oxidizing agent or reducing agent. So we need an oxidizing agent uh, to, of course, oxidize our alcohol to that carbonyl, and we need some sort of reducing agent in order to add on our extra hydrogens and uh, remove that extra bond to our oxygen. So some kind of reducing agent will eliminate that uh, as we go into our, our alcohol. Now one thing you might notice here is that we actually have some similarities to the previous hydrogenation and dehydrogenation reactions that we looked at with alkenes and alkenes. Right? So when we're oxidizing that alcohol, we're removing hydrogens, we're essentially doing a dehydrogenation similar to when we go from an alkane to an alkene. Right? That alkane to alkene dehydrogenation reaction is actually also an oxidation reaction. Right? because we're losing bonds to our less electronegative hydrogens and gaining bonds to uh, our carbons, which of course have equal electronegativity to our, our carbons instead of the lower electronegativity that makes it more reduced. Um, whereas our reduction reaction of our carbonyl is similar to the hydrogenation reaction of our alkenes. Right? We're adding on hydrogens to this double bond. Since we're adding on those less electronegative atoms, it's, of course, a reduction reaction. So our hydrogenation is a reduction reaction. Our dehydrogenation is an oxidation reaction. Now let's take a look at specifically what reagents we're going to be using here for our oxidation and reduction reagents with alcohols. We will see some similarities with the previous oxidation reduction reactions of alkenes and alkenes, but we'll also see some new reagents used here as well. So let's start out by looking at our reduction reactions and our familiar hydrogenation reaction. So with our hydrogenation reaction, we're going to be taking, in this case, a carbonyl compound. So we have our carbon double bonded to oxygen. I'll put a carbon on one side and a hydrogen on the other. Now our reagents, of course, for hydrogenation are our hydrogen gas and, of course, that metal catalyst. Right. Again, this could be platinum, it could be palladium, it could be nickel. Um, we have a wide variety of different metals that we can use. Uh, the key is just that we need that metal surface to bond to our hydrogens. So we'll individual hydrogens sticking up from the surface, and we'll come in with our double bond and do a syn addition of those two hydrogens on either side of our double bond. So the mechanism is just like what we saw before for our uh, alkenes. Um, only in this case we get an alcohol product instead of the alkene product that we saw with our alkenes. Right? So those two hydrogens are added on and we produce our alcohol. Notice in this case I've produced a primary alcohol right? because I have uh, just my one carbon bonded to the carbon that has my alcohol. So this primary alcohol is formed whenever we react a aldehyde um, in this hydrogenation reaction. So aldehyde is our uh, particular name for a carbonyl that has hydrogens attached. Right? So we have a hydrogen attached to our, our carbon double bond to our oxygen. That's our, our carbonyl there. 
And when we add on those hydrogens, we then get our, our primary alcohol. We can also do this hydrogenation with a ketone. Uh, so a ketone would have our uh, carbonyl bonded to uh, two carbons on either side. And now, of course, when we add on those hydrogens, we're still adding our, our hydrogen gas. And of course, um, I'll have uh, palladium in this case as my metal catalyst. Now we add on those two hydrogens on either side of that carbon-oxygen double bond. We end up with our two carbons here, creating a secondary alcohol. Right. So the classification of the substitution pattern of our alcohol depends on the structure of our carbonyl, and we classify these as either ketones or aldehydes based on uh, the, the carbons that are present here within our carbonyl compound. Now you'll notice here that we can't actually produce a tertiary alcohol using this reduction reaction. Right? So a tertiary alcohol would look like this, where we have three carbons attached, and of course if we're going to have three carbons attached here, um, our carbon bonds aren't broken in this oxidation reaction. So that would require that our carbonyl looks something like this. Now, of course, you should immediately notice our carbon here has five bonds that breaks our octet. So this compound doesn't exist, and therefore we can't easily form our tertiary alcohols in this uh, reduction reaction. So we're only going to see primary and secondary alcohols as our common products here of our hydrogenation reaction. Our next possible reducing agent is a metal hydride, creating a metal hydride reduction. So our, our example of a metal hydride is shown here, our sodium borohydrate. Um, so our boron acts as our, our metal. It's actually going to be anionic in this case with those four bonds to our hydrogens and our sodium is acting as the counter ion here. Um, we use this in a water or alcohol-based solvent. Uh, you pick one or the other of these, depending on uh, what you want to use. And of course, our overall uh, starting reactant and product uh, will still be the same. We're starting from a carbonyl. We're adding on hydrogens to produce our alcohol. Now, the reaction mechanism here for our metal hydride reduction is, of course, going to be quite different from that hydrogenation reaction. Um, so our key reagent here is the, the borohydride ion. Now, of course, one of the things that we saw with boron is that borons are actually less electronegative than hydrogens. So our hydrogen actually pulls electron density towards itself and becomes nucleophilic. Um, so if we take that nucleophilic hydrogen, we can then react with our carbonyl. And in our carbonyl, we have an electrophilic carbon um, due to the polarized bond between our carbon and our oxygen. So this reaction will actually look kind of similar to uh, the reaction of our nucleophilic uh, organometallic compounds with our carbonyls. Um, so we're going to take our hydrogen here and we're going to attack our electrophilic carbon. Our electrons here will then move out of the way up to our oxygen that of course already has attracted towards those, those electrons. Um, so we pull it up there and we end up putting our uh, hydrogen then on that carbon that we need for our final product. Now at the same time, our oxygen does end up attacking our boron as well. Um, so we're actually going to end up with an intermediate where we have our boron attached to our oxygen. And of course, we attach our nucleophilic hydrogen to the carbon. So we end up with this kind of uh, borohydrate intermediate. Um, this boron compound can actually react with other carbonyls, so you'll end up with multiple carbonyls attached to that single boron. Um, and then we're just going to use uh, the water or the alcohol to add uh, to react as an acid and replace our boron with the hydrogen. Uh, so it's just getting replaced to create that extra hydrogen there in our final product. Again, of course, you should notice the similarities here between uh, this reaction versus the nucleophilic attack of our organometallic compound. So again, we have that nucleophile attacking our electrophilic carbonyl carbon. Electrons are moving out of the way up to the oxygen. 
and then eventually we're, we're protonating that oxygen to get our final alcohol product. Now, of course, our metal hydride reduction reaction can also be applied to our ketones as well. So I could take uh, this ketone here and add in my sodium borohydride. And in this case, I'll add uh, methanol here as my solvent. Again, this could be any alcohol or water. Um, and again, I'm just going to be adding on my two hydrogens, one hydrogen from my uh, borohydride, and then the second hydrogen from my alcohol. And I produce, of course, a secondary alcohol since I started from that ketone with my two carbons on either side of that carbonyl carbon. So we can again create a variety of different kinds of alcohol products, primary or secondary, depending on what the structure of our carbonyl is. Now there are also other metal hydrides that we can use here as well. Um, so another common metal hydride that's used is a lithium aluminum hydride. So we have lithium, aluminum, and this is going to have uh, our hydrogens there as well that are going to be bonded to that aluminum. Um, it acts in a very similar way to our sodium borohydride, right, where that aluminum is going to be bonded to our hydrogens, and our hydrogens are going to be nucleophilic there since our metal has very low electronegativity. Um, now, this lithium aluminum hydride is a much stronger reducing agent than our, our sodium borohydride. So when we react with our lithium aluminum hydride, we're going to add that first and add our water in a second step after we have our lithium aluminum hydride. Uh, so lithium aluminum hydride will actually react violently with water. Um, so we always want to use this in a ether-based solvent where we have no water present and we don't uh, react directly with our, our lithium aluminum hydride. Now, since our lithium aluminum hydride is a stronger reducing agent, it can actually react with more oxidized compounds as well. So if we have a compound that is a carboxylic acid, so a carboxylic acid has our carbonyl carbon oxygen double bond, but it also has an extra oxygen attached to our carbon, right? So our carbon here is even more oxidized with three bonds to oxygen compared to the two bonds to oxygen for our ketones or aldehydes. So in this case, we're going to react. We're going to um, react this all the way to our primary alcohol. So we end up uh, removing two bonds to oxygens here and replacing those, of course, with our hydrogens. Right? So it's, it reduces that carboxylic acid all the way down to again, a primary alcohol, right? This is always going to be a primary alcohol because our carboxylic acid, it can only have one bond to a carbon since it always has these three bonds to oxygens. So we can actually react um, both carboxylic acids and carbonyls with our, our stronger reducing agent of our lithium aluminum hydride. Um, our sodium borohydride is a bit of a, a weaker reducing agent, so it only works with our, our carbonyl compounds, um, and it isn't able to reduce our carboxylic acid. Now we're ready to take a look at the reverse of our reduction reactions, which would be our oxidation reactions. Just like our reduction reactions, our oxidation reactions can use mild oxidizers or strong oxidizers, and this will lead to slightly different products. Uh, most of the oxidizing reagents that we use in organic chemistry tend to be based on the chromate ion. Um, so our, our common mild oxidizers are uh, PCC or PDC. So this is uh, pyridinium chlorochromate or pyridinium dichromate. And I'll show you the structure here. So it's an ionic compound based on our pyridinium base. So we have an aromatic ring with a nitrogen, with the hydrogen, and a positive charge. And this is going to be combined with our chlorochromate ionic compound with a negative charge. Um, so our chromate is acting as our oxidizer here. Uh, pyridinium helps it to be a, a more mild oxidant um, compared to some of the stronger oxidizers that we'll look at later. 
So, in our reaction, of course, they're going to be going now from an alcohol over to our uh, carbonyl. So we can start with either a primary or a secondary alcohol. So I'll start with my primary ethanol here. Um, I'm going to react it with, uh, I'll add PDC here. So my pyridinium dichromate, which will be uh, very similar in structure to my pyridinium chlorochromate. Um, again, just acting as a mild oxidizer. And so we're going to be uh, adding bonds to oxygen and taking away our hydrogen there, and we end up producing an aldehyde. Right? So if we start with a primary alcohol and we add a mild oxidizer, we produce an aldehyde. Again, of course, as before, I could also have a secondary alcohol. And I could add, I'll use my PCC, pyridinium chlorochromate. And in this case, I produce a ketone. All right, so secondary alcohol goes to ketone. Again, a tertiary alcohol would not react um, because we can't easily form that double bond there um, and without breaking our octet. Now for our strong oxidizers, we're again going to be using uh, chromate-based compounds. Uh, but here we're either going to use uh, chromic acid, uh, so that's H2CrO4, a very strong acid, and an oxidizer. Or we can uh, combine sulfuric acid, our H2SO4, with a uh, chromate salt. in order to uh, form our reactive uh, chromic acid in our solution, right? So it's either chromic acid or sulfuric acid plus our, our chromate salt. So our strong oxidizers here will be able to oxidize our alcohols even further than these mild oxidizers, right? So if we start with a primary alcohol, such as the alcohol is shown here, I can react it. Uh, I'm going to use sulfuric acid combined with my chromate salt in the presence of water. And uh, so I'm going to react this. I'm going to oxidize it all the way from my alcohol to a carboxylic acid. All right, so we're able to produce that more oxidized compound with my three bonds to those oxygens uh, with my stronger oxidizer whereas my mild oxidizers only produce my carbonyls of the, the aldehyde or the ketone. So my primary alcohol here is going to a carboxylic acid. Um, if I have a secondary alcohol, um, I would actually still produce a ketone with my strong oxidizer, um, again, because I just don't have room to add extra bonds to oxygens here. Right. If I were to try to add another oxygen on, then I'd have five bonds and I'd be breaking the octet. Um, so secondary alcohols will only ever go to ketones, uh, regardless of uh, whether we're using a mild or a strong oxidizer. Now in terms of mechanisms, I'm not going to show you the full mechanism here for uh, these oxidation reactions, uh, but essentially what's happening is that our chromate ion gets added on to our oxygen in, in exchange for that hydrogen. And then we have essentially an elimination reaction following our, our typical elimination mechanism. Um, we're going to be pulling off the hydrogen from our adjacent carbon and forming our double bond. Right? So this is getting eliminated and we kick off our, our chromate ion as the leaving group as we go to produce our, our double bond of our, our carbonyl here. Um, so the, the mechanism is, is somewhat similar to other mechanisms that we've seen in the past, um, but we won't go over the, the full mechanism here. The last oxidizing agent that I want to look at with you today is um, actually periodic acid, or HiO4. Um, and this periodic acid allows us to uh, create an oxidative cleavage. So if we have a vicinal dial, so a diol would be uh, two alcohols, and vicinal just refers to those uh, two functional groups being on adjacent carbons. 
So here I have my, my vicinal dial, two alcohols, each on adjacent carbons. I'm going to be reacting this with my periotic acid. And what's going to happen here is that we are, of course, going to oxidize our two alcohols to carbonyls, but we're also going to uh, break the bond in between our vicinal dials. And so in this case, we'd actually be creating uh, two units of our identical aldehyde product. Um, so this ends up being our, our only product that's produced as we're breaking that uh, vicinal dial in half. Um, so it's still an oxidation reaction, right? We're still removing hydrogens and adding on our, our double bond to the oxygen, uh, but it has kind of this weird consequence of also uh, breaking our, uh, our dial apart as we create those new carbonyls. So what we see here is there are a variety of ways to convert between alcohols and our more oxidized oxygen-based functional groups, whether it's aldehydes, carbonyls, or carboxylic acids. In the lab, of course, we use a variety of different reagents to convert back and forth between these, um, but our body is also doing these reactions as well, right? So our reactions inside the body are quite similar, but there, of course, we're using more biologically friendly um, oxidizing or reducing agents. Um, so we need uh, specific molecules that are, are more safe and aren't going to have any uh, dangerous side reactions in the body. Um, and these will allow us to then uh, carefully control when we oxidize things to, of course, create more energy, or when we reduce things in order to create particular biomolecules that we need within our body.